Coming up next on Nevada Week in Review, the lieutenant governor won't be facing felony charges. The countdown begins to the grand opening of City Center. Gaming revenue plummets again for the month. That's 22 monthly declines in a row. All that and more coming up next on Nevada Week in Review. Welcome to Nevada Week in Review. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce the media panel. Valerie Miller is a business reporter for the Las Vegas Business Press. Kevin Bollinger is an anchor reporter for Fox 5 News. Ben Spillman covers politics for the Las Vegas Review Journal. And Edward Lawrence just left Channel 8 this week for job opportunities on the East Coast. And I guess we should probably say goodbye to you. Now you're off to greener pastures in the Big Apple. Not just the East Coast, nationwide. Freelancing for? F for freelancing for the networks, um, CBS, uh, CNN, possibly. So we, we wish you well. You're going to be missed. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about Mr. Crow Licky, but first, take a look at this. It has been a long, winding road to get to this point. Crow Licky and his staff had been accused in 2007 of spending $1.5 million on marketing outside the bounds of legislative oversight. On Monday, Judge Valerie Adair dismissed the case, saying Cortez Masto and prosecutors presented vague evidence that lacked specifics. Well, today, the AG blasted back, saying Adair overstepped her role on the bench and reaffirmed that this was not simply an accounting error. She can't refile charges because the statute of limitations has lapsed, so the only option is to go after the judge. Cortez Masto will not do that. Citing the state budget crisis, she wishes the case to be left alone. I do not believe it is in the best interest of the state to proceed further with this case. My office has reached the goal I have set for them shining a light on an elected official who misused the powers of his office. You, Reports out of Washington now say Krolicki has started testing the waters to run a Senate campaign against Harry Reid. No word from Krolicki's office or from his attorney today. Some people believe that this did hurt the attorney general politically. First, she was criticized because her husband was planning a political fundraiser for Krolicki's opponent. Uh, then this comes out, and there's some speculation that Maybe she overplayed her hand. You hearing that? Well, I don't think anybody's happy with how it turned out. You know, Krolicki is upset because he feels that he was wrongly accused and dragged through all this for really at the end, uh, you know, nothing to happen. And nobody on, you know, the Democratic side who are, you know, supporters of um, the Attorney General are happy with how it turned out either, obviously, because the case didn't even make it into the into court. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't help any of the, uh, it didn't help any of the parties involved. It'll be interesting to see how this goes from here in terms of not only if, if Crowley Key decides to jump into the Senate race or run for re-election, but also now the state Republicans are talking about putting somebody up against Cortez Masto when a lot of people thought that she wasn't going to be opposed by any big challengers coming up in her next election. So there's going to be some follow-up maybe on both sides in terms of their political futures and, and where their next step is from here. Yeah, before I talk about Crowley Key and perhaps his U uh, U.S. Senate bid, uh, it's still up in the air at this point, the, the charges seem sort of murky to some people. I mean, he spent this money on advertising, allegedly promoting himself, but then there's a lot, and, and your article pointed this out, actually. Uh, State Treasurer ha has done this. Uh, the mayor of the city of Las Vegas has done this. Lots of politicians have done this. So why, why was he singled well, out? Well, there's the charges, and the charges relate to, you know, the allegation that he, this money from the college savings program wasn't reported to the general fund like it was supposed to be. And it's almost the way it was seemed presented on Thursday was that the fact that some of it was used for marketing that included Krolicki in advertising was almost like a sidelight, although that was included in, you know, it was, it was talked about, but that in and of itself isn't a crime. And other politicians do mix personal imagery with uh, their official duties. It's almost unavoidable. Yeah, uh, let, let's go on and talk about uh, Krolicki's political future. It, it's perhaps a little late to start thinking about running against Reid, and I guess there's, there's 10 or 11 people that are running against him on the Republican side now. Well, the, the, the chatter is definitely picked up. You know, people have talked about this potential run against Reid. He hasn't 
dismissed it, but his uh, campaign consultant, or his uh, consultant, um, Ryan Irwin, is already working for John Chachas, who is a, a Republican running against Reed, so that would be a suggestion that he wouldn't. And also, um, Crookley does have a re-elect me for lieutenant governor website, um, so he s seems to be leaning toward uh, the re-elect me for lieutenant governor direction, but, you know, who knows? I think people would be naive to think, though, that, that Krolicki or the Republican, National Republican Party doesn't have a poll out there uh, or preparing to go out and, and poll and see how he stacks up against Reed right now for this next election in, in, in comparison with the other 10 Republican candidates. If they get the numbers that they like, they may change their focus. but. Like you said, probably more likely that he'll go for re-election on lieutenant governor, I would say. Well, I do want to talk about just briefly this fundraiser that he uh, went ahead and canceled. He's got close to $13 million. I mean, you, you talk about a money-making machine. It is definitely Harry Reid's re-election campaign. But then he, he was going to adjourn the Senate to go back. And then he was sort of obliquely, if not uh, really <laughs> forcefully criticized by some members of the Republican Party for, what are you doing? We're supposed to be here working on health care reform. And you're taking a break just to attend a fundraiser. So he, how's that going to hurt him? He's forcefully criticized by Republicans no matter what he does. <laughs> he was forcefully criticized when it came out that he was going to have this, you know, some weeks back because the suggestion was that uh, um, it came out around the time the health care debate was really heating up and there was uh, some changes to the legislation that would have sent more money to Louisiana um, that would have benefited, uh, you know, Landrew. And he was heavily criticized for that. Now he's canceling it, um, you know, in the face of this other criticism. So it's almost like anything he does that, I, don't, I was going to say anything he does that's official is going to be criticized or political it's criticized. He's, he's criticized no matter what he does. Yeah. All right, let's move on um, to this special session that was uh, talked about uh, this week. And we do have a background report. Take a look. Reading from a prepared statement, Governor Jim Gibbons laid out the state's money problems and some potential action that could be taken. The budget has increased excessively and the revenue to support the added spending has not. Total revenue is up, that's called tax increases, but spending is up even more. This cannot continue. The state must live within its means. Gibbons has convened an economic forum to make a revised forecast and deliver a report on January 19th. In the meantime, he's told state agencies to prepare two budgets, one with 1.4 percent in cuts, the other with 3 percent in cuts. That would potentially include layoffs, increased furloughs, and a reduction in services. State Democratic leaders say that it's important that the governor doesn't move too fast. Things have to be done prudently, and it can be dangerous if you don't cut, and it can be dangerous if you do cut. So I'm probably more cautious than the governor. He's pulling the trigger very careful, uh, very quickly before our staff has even had an opportunity to review those numbers. Assembly Speaker Barbara Buckley says budget reductions can be done by the interim committee, avoiding the cost of a special legislative session. But a special session is needed to change a law that prevents the state from applying for as much as $175 million in education grants. Some of the lawmakers are saying, Governor, you've got this $160 million line of credit. Why don't you tap into that? And in fact, this week, the chancellor really lit into Gibbons. Um, very, very critical. Almost sounded like Jim Rogers, in a way, because they theoretically could avoid some of these cuts they're talking about if they just do the line of credit. Oh, and obviously the option is there. It was voted on by the legislature for them to go and tap into that. But I think that, that the governor is looking at, at all of his options, and that's why he's asking for uh, the stuff to come back on Tuesday that had the, the 1.4 and the 3% cut so he can kind of lay it all out. But uh, it is inevitable that that special session is going to have to be called because they're going to want to go after those grants anyway. It's just a matter of does he do it later after they've already, uh, you know, kind of revised the budget uh, and just concentrate strictly on the, the school uh, money that they're trying to get, or does he do it earlier and try and get it all done together at the same time? And I think there's talk that from uh, talking to some of the lawmakers that they may have the special session just on trying to get the uh, the extra funding for education, you know, change in Nevada law, so they would be eligible for that, but that the stuff could be done in interim committee in terms of the budget cuts. And in fact, a lot of the lawmakers want those any cuts to be done in an interim committee. And it's interesting because 
some people who didn't want to go on the record said it, you know, the lawmakers are in a kind of a lose-lose uh, position here. The legislatures, especially the Democrats, because you're not going to want to go into session and have to vote for more pay cuts and lay off state workers, and they're your constituency. They're the ones that have to reelect you, so they would, you know, I've been hearing it, they would actually rather that if it, these cuts are going to be made that are painful and unpopular, let the governor do it. Plus, they can't uh, raise any money for their campaigns during the special session or for 15 days after that, so that kind of ties their hands up a bit as well. Uh, it's going to be really interesting <laughs> To, to watch this because I think, as Valerie pointed out, they could do this with the Interim Finance Committee in terms of the 50 million or 60 million in their short, but they do need that $175 million in race to the top, up to $175 million in race to the top federal grants. And they're talking about 600 hours it's going to take to put those applications together. The deadline is June. They missed the January deadline, essentially. Uh, but they're going to have to get all that approved and get all the application process done. 600 hours obviously is a lot of workload uh, that somebody's going to have to take on to get that before the June deadline to do it. So you would have to imagine the special session is going to have to be called earlier than later so it's not just wasted work if they decide not to repeal that law. Yep. All right, let's move on to uh, City Center. We, we've had several openings, but the big opening actually is on December 16th, so take a look at this. Aria sits in the middle of City Center and will employ three-fourths of all the people working at the $8.5 billion resort. Today, the man responsible for building and soon running the 4,000-room hotel casino says this project has been added to the must-see list for all tourists coming to Las Vegas from when it opens through January. Everybody who is coming to Vegas, we believe, is going to come see City Center. Those are potential customers Macbeth says MGM Mirage will not lose. He told the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority Board, history proved critics wrong when they say a new mega resort is too big, like when the Mirage first opened, or too expensive like when the Bellagio opened. We believe it represents a revitalization of Las Vegas, uh, and it's going to give the consumer reason to come back. Attracting new customers is the key, according to Macbeth. Economic analyst Jeremy Aguero says other casinos, like Wynn Las Vegas, should worry that City Center may steal customers. Still, the president of Wynn called City Center a great symbol. I hope, as you point out, that it, it serves as the catalyst for you know, our growth going into the future. I think that it's... Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to be able to talk about. So is City Center a good idea to open a resort this massive? Well, look, City Center's ambitious, right? And I think that's, that's the word that everyone's been using about City Center for the past five years. Aguero believes it will transform Las Vegas in the future because he says for every one of the 12,000 new jobs at City Center, one more job in the community will be created because of the economic ripple effect. I think it's probably the most talked about story of Nevada we could review. Literally, it seems like we've done it maybe every other week or maybe every week. And, and so many people are pinning their hopes on economic revival in this town based on the success of, of City Center. And, and it, well, there's a balancing act that's going on because you are losing about 9,000 construction jobs, but you're gaining about 12,000 permanent jobs. Some of those permanent jobs are, are relying on tips, so there's a little bit of a risk. But when you keep I mean, 12,000 permanent jobs is, is good anywhere. I mean, any community would take that. And any economic activity is better than no economic activity, uh, according to Jeremy Agrero when I, when I talked to him about that. So. What are they saying in terms of uh, so, something we really haven't talked that much about are the condos, you know, how are they doing? And also right. conventions. There's actually that ability to have conventions meeting in City Center. Yeah, exactly. There's a, a huge convention space in ARIA, which is going to open uh, on Wednesday, uh, December 16th. Um, the convention, as I'm told, the convention bookings are very, very good going through uh, 2010 and 2011. Um, about 80% of where the Bellagio was when it opened. Now, Bellagio doesn't have huge convention space. Um, and the, the numbers of rooms that they're selling or renting um, are just tracking about the same. It, in terms of condos, the Mandarin has done, done very well. 94% of those condos are, are sold. Um, however, <laughs> Vidar is not doing as well. And MGM is, is basically going to, to underwrite the loans. They're going to say, um, you know, we will, we will offer our own financing uh, for folks who can try and get these, because obviously the banks are very tight on their money. Um, I, so. I think it's unusual, though. It seems like they've really reached out to the local market more so than perhaps other mega strip openings. 
A concerted May effort maybe. or is it just appearance? I, I, that might be just an appearance because to make City Center work, and, and MGM executives have made no bones about it, you have to bring new people in. Um, not just the folks who are here. You can't just reshuffle the decks. You can't just rearrange the chairs. Um, you've got to bring new people in. And in partnering with Dubai, they're hoping to tap into some of the Middle Eastern money, which now we see may not be there as much, but uh, they're trying to tap into some of that Middle Eastern money. They're trying to, the, the um, joint ventures that they have done with Dubai World uh, and, and some of the Middle East folks building hotels and whatnot have been very good over there. Um, so they're trying to bring those folks this direction uh, and, and get them around the world. Okay, well the, the town definitely does need it because I, we had some gaming figures that uh, just came out and we have a background report on that. So take a look. Strip is still one of America's hottest destinations. A new figure show the cash isn't hitting the felt. October gaming numbers show an 11.6% decrease from this time last year. That's the 22nd straight month of decline. The more than $800 million in gaming revenues is the lowest monthly figure in six years. This comes on the heels of a report that visitors increased for the second straight month, up 3.7%. Gaming expert Bill Thompson says that budgets still rule the roost. They want to come here because they can have a lot of fun at, at a low cost. Uh, the number one tourist activity in town is walking, seeing the fountains, seeing the pirate show, uh, seeing the canals. Uh, it's not the expense of entertainment. People are still gambling, but are finding ways to play as long on less money. You can play a 25 cent machine instead of a dollar machine, and uh, although your payback's not quite as good, uh, it gives you maybe an extra couple hours playing time each day. Some tours we talked to have eliminated gambling out of their plans completely. We decided not to gamble this year. Um, too much money. I did more of the visiting than the gambling this time. Others are still planning on hitting the casinos hard. Plan to go home with nothing, so that's what I'm doing, just enjoying it. Bottom line, getting more people here is the first step, which seems to be happening, but the gaming numbers likely will stay stagnant as long as the economy does. The American economy comes back. That's what provides the customers for Las Vegas. There's this interesting conundrum, uh, October, 3.7% increase in visitors. So more and more people are coming to Las Vegas, but these gaming figures just shocked everybody. I guess the strip numbers would have been worse if it hadn't been for high-end Baccarat play, but for this 11% uh, double digit, it's just, when is it gonna end or when is it gonna start? And that's the big question in terms of, of people spending their money here. We already know the room rates have gone down, so they're spending less money with that. And, and people seem to be coming with the budget. The key, though, is that they're coming again. And the fact that, that it did go up uh, is, is a good indicator that people are coming. Now the, the thing is to try and get them into the casinos, and you notice that a lot more casinos on the Strip are putting that live entertainment uh, aspect back in. To, to the stuff on the strip so people can gamble and kind of watch what's going on at the same time, keep them in the casinos, maybe keep them playing a little bit longer and try and drive those figures up. But those numbers will also go up. We're coming up on some big sports book type stuff coming up with the NFL playoffs and Super Bowl and March Madness that will hopefully pump a, a little bit more money in. And we'll see how the, the December numbers will be interesting with all the uh, stuff with NFR here and NASCAR and see if those numbers go up as well. There's also been a shift a little bit in um, gaming versus non-gaming versus gaming revenue. Um, the you know, previous year, Ted, decade ago, 15 years ago, it was majority gambling money is where the casinos made their money, and non-gaming revenue was kind of an afterthought. Now, uh, the Bellagio, it's 60-40. 60 percent of the revenue comes from non-gaming, 40 percent comes from gaming. City Center goes a little bit farther, actually, MGM's going, it's 80-20. 80 percent non-revenue, 20 percent uh, non-gaming revenue, 20 percent gaming revenue. So there's also that fundamental shift where they're making more money from the shops, from the shows, and from the restaurants. Wow. I well, think when you look at something like Crystal, though, the question is, you know, are in this economy, are people going to be able, the average uh, tourist going to be able to afford those type of prices? Uh, I actually took, did the tourist thing and went through Crystal last night, went to Videra, uh, it was 9.30 at night, but there wasn't a lot of people around, although interestingly, one of the people who was around was Steve Wynn walking through window shopping, but I didn't see anybody buying anything. They were just looking, walking around. As long as Steve around. Wynn buys, yeah, I guess they, they didn't need okay, anybody else. Right, else. It could have been <laughs> yeah, those shops high, are very high end. Uh, I did want to move on to th this idea. Another story, <laughs> I'm sorry for all the bleak news, but uh, the foreclosure filings, uh, a report came in that Nevada still has the highest 
foreclosure rate in the country, but here's the silver lining. Las Vegas is no longer number one. I think it slipped to number five. So Nevada is, the, the state is number one ahead of Florida, California, Arizona, and Idaho. But and I think Nevada also uh, dropped by about uh, 30, 33 percent when they compared it to about a year ago. So the number of filings are down. But I think what people are worried about and uh, forecasters are not too optimistic about is was unemployment at about 13 yeah. percent and foreclosures being a long drug out process that you know sometimes can go on for a year. What, what's this going to mean for the future when um, these people go through their savings and if they can't find other work, are we going to see like another wave of foreclosures and see this number go back up again? Real briefly, you had a story. Uh, Operation Stolen Hope tried to go after some of these mortgage relief scammers. Uh, Senator Reid is kind of behind that. Yeah, he uh, he came out and headed up a press conference. It was uh, combined with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the Attorney General's office and local officials like the uh, Foreclosure Prevention Task Force. And what they're trying to do is crack down on this uh, rampant mortgage modification. Um, not that all of them are scams, but there's a lot out there that are scams, the mortgage relief scams. And um, Attorney General Cart Catherine Cortez Moyesto said that uh, at this point, these are become so lucrative. It's not just like operations here in the state that these uh, mortgage per, mortgage relief scams actually are tied to like um, organized crime in other countries. People are on the most wanted list, child prostitution. So it's become this really lucrative industry. Um, the one thing is uh, some of the actually legitimate licensed mortgage modifiers are concerned that some of the proposals, like maybe limiting upfront fees, will just drive them out of business. Well, and there, there are 154 companies that the Attorney General has complaints against, and those 154 companies that do these loan modifications have somewhere around 40,000 victims that they're uh, estimating are out there in, in just Clark County alone. Amazing. And not everybody complains, so those right. are just Yeah, the I don't ones. even know the real, the real number. Edward, I had to save this for you because this is just like your beat. <laughs> and I don't know who I'm going to call anymore to cover Yucca Mountain. I'll have to find somebody. Well, you may, maybe you won't have to. <laughs> it might be over. But it, is it really on life support? It, I mean, it is on life support. There's a new GAO report that just came out, uh, Government Accountability Office, um, and it says that it is cheaper to keep the, the stuff, the, the byproduct, the nuclear material on site where it's produced than it is to ship it to one site and, and store it for eternity. So um, that report puts another knife in it. Now, again, it takes an act of Congress to reverse the Screw Nevada bill. So that bill is still law, that Yucca Mountain, that site, is a nuclear repository. So until Congress officially changes the law, it's not going to change. However, um, in the budget for 2011, um, there's money to shut it down. Uh, the, the, the money that is designated for Yucca Mountain is designated to shut it down. Um, they've also cut the um, National uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission's budget to license Yucca Mountain. Um, so all of this is signaling an end to it. Uh, it's just Congress officially has to do it. Change the law. Uh, and I have time for the last story, which is, uh, Ben, you wrote about this. This is the marijuana initiative. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, it, mm -hmm. They're going to gather signatures, and it, it's actually the state would tax and regulate. Yeah, they don't have a lot of the details in it yet. They haven't presented the um, initiative language, and they haven't even said if they're going to go for a statutory uh, change or a constitutional amendment. But kind of the interesting thing about it is that a lot of the legislation or the initiatives that have happened over... Um, recent years in California and other places have been related to medical marijuana. Um, the indication here is they're talking about just straight up taxing and regulating marijuana uh, and not distinguishing whether or not it's for you know medical use or recreational use and that's um, kind of the one of the interesting uh, things about it but it's it's still a long ways off they don't have signatures they need to get the signatures this year well I guess it would be next year 2010 to go on the ballot I believe in 2012 um, and it hasn't been successful up to this point. Um, there have been, I think, two previous initiatives that have failed. The margin of failure has been getting smaller, and they think they can kind of tip it into uh, their favor in, uh, you know, in the next couple of years here. Whether or not they can is, you know, remains to be seen. I think they f maybe think the economy will work in their favor. The people will feel that the state is so desperate for money that anything that they could uh, get some money from would be, uh, you know, people would... Uh, 
um, be inclined to look at it. So there's going to be a prostitution initiative coming up to raise money? <laughs> well, prostitution is already legal in, uh, you know, much of Nevada, so I, I don't know. Not in Clark or Washoe. Not in Clark <laughs> or Washoe. probably raise a lot more money there. And that has been suggested, you know, the, the tax, and that the lawmakers have stayed away from that because they would view that as, you know, legitimizing the activity. It's a, definitely a touchy. On the one hand, you don't want to raise taxes on people's pay, or on, uh, you know, anything that people don't have a choice over. Um, but you don't want to cut services, so. It's all predicated on the fact if they remember to turn in the signatures. You remember a couple of years ago, they forgot to turn in their <laughs> signatures. They had them, they had it ready to go, and forgot. <laughs> so. There was all sorts of bad jokes <laughs> about that. We really don't want to go there at all, do we? <laughs> See, on that note, Edward, this is how people are going to remember <laughs> and, uh, we can review on legalizing prostitution. In any case, uh, we are out no. of time. Um, legalizing, legalizing marijuana, marijuana and prostitution. We kind of touched on you. both, actually. Uh, we wish you well. Thank you. Uh, going to New York, so bundle up. It's particularly cold, I understand, yes. that time of year, this time of year. So anyway, it's been a great discussion. That's all the time we've got left on this edition of Nevada Week in Review. I'd like to thank Ben Spillman from the RJ, uh, Valerie Miller from the Business Press, Kevin Bollinger from Fox 5 News, and freelance journalist Edward Lawrence. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.